in startup funds. So when they've looked at this, they find that one of the reasons that women aren't as successful at the other end is at the beginning, they're not given the same packages. Is it the same thing about sort of the career and even like the personal life course between men and women is that when you have two applicants, men are generally promoted on potential, whereas women have to be promoted on accomplishment. So no one will really give you the benefit of the doubt. You have to have already proven yourself mm -hmm. and established merit in order to get somewhere, whereas someone will look at a male applicant with the same qualifications and say, he seems like he could do it, let's give him a shot type of thing. So there's another sort of unseen barrier in just the way people interpret your capabilities as you move forward. Okay. So what happened with musicians in orchestras, do you know? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, there was that study, right, where more men kept getting selected as opposed to women. So they had the, they, they had like a uh, wall, I think, in front of the people who were auditioning so that they could see if it was a gender reason. Um, and more men kept getting selected, and then they found out that it was the sound of women's high heels as they approached the audition room that was still affecting who would be chosen or not. So when they took all of that out, what happened? I think it was equal. Yeah, women got selected. And so today in major orchestras, you see many more women than you did before, right? Same kind of thing. Another study done in CVs, when they took the names and any other identifying, you know, off the CV, whether it be gender or culture, or whatever, the selection was different, okay? And if you had those on the curriculum vitae, it was bias. All right, so that, those are all very important. So the sticky floor, probably this is why we see some of this, at least in medical schools. So here's all the women entry, okay? And so here's, you know, matriculates, and graduates, and residents, and associates. And as time goes on, there's very few women who become deans and department chairs, and many more men, okay? And, you know, people say, History will change that, but in the last 70 years in American medical schools, the departments of pediatrics haven't changed. And women have been at least 50% of department of pediatrics for all of that time. Because that's what women used to go into. So we may not have had a lot of women, but they tended to go into pediatrics at the beginning. We still have very few women. We have more deans than we have department chairs because deans are kind of a different job. And why do we have more deans than department chairs in the last 10 years? Because now there's another level, and it's mostly men, okay? And it's called Vice President for Health Affairs. And it used to be that the man was the dean and the Vice President for Health Affairs, and now they've separated those jobs. Okay, so you have to look really closely on what's happened. Now, what's the glass cliff? And this was new to me. I, thought I, I just read something with this in it, but I don't, I don't remember. Yeah? <laughs> Isn't it when women are given impossible tasks that they can't expect to complete that men would never do? Mm -hmm. And then they're expected to just dive in and try anyways? Mm -hmm. And they do often, and sometimes they can complete them. That's exactly right. So it's the phenomenon in which women are more likely to be put into leadership roles under risky and precarious circumstances. Only recently have I been told, um, I, um, Step down, I'll tell you my story later in the year, but uh, as dean, it was all politics in the state of Georgia. Um, and I was recently told by somebody that nobody thought that I could be successful at what I did. And I was really successful, and they were really angry. <laughs> all right, and that's part of the reason why I just stepped down. It's pretty incredible, but they gave it to a woman because they really didn't think it was good. How about the woman who took over after the Brexit vote? The minute I heard that, I said, is this a glass cliff job, right? Is that going to be an impossible way to be successful after that Brexit vote, right? And so much more likely to give it to a woman and much more likely for a woman to accept. What if the woman fails? Gender is blamed. Gender is blamed. Women can't do this. A negative on her career. I think in corporations, the same thing happened to Carly Fiorina as well when she took over from Xerox, and they were in the middle of like coming down after a horrible management, mm -hmm. and then when they ended up filing for bankruptcy, she was like 
can't speak to her political views, but right. she was blamed for you know not having the aptitude to lead. That's exactly right. So you see this, it's not just it's not just medicine, it's, it's other things. So we can talk about the biological and stuff, but actually what I want to do is kind of skip this because we're, we can talk about this later. All the challenges for women, okay, and we know all these uh, measures and so forth, because I'm going to get to some new data. And I know I only have a few minutes because I want to get to get you to think, because you've got this whole year, okay, where you're going to hear from male and female leaders. And so here are some new data. And this data is coming not from medicine, it is coming from the Harvard Business School. So there has been a big study done of graduates of the Harvard Business School, mostly of um, the MBA students. Okay, so these are people who got their MBA at Harvard. That's a very prestigious MBA. So they had to be smart to get in. They have a lot of women. They're, they actually did a survey of 25,000 people. 10,000 of them were women. No, 10,000 of them were um, baby boomers, and I think the other 12,000 were millennials, and there were some other um, wire, you know, was it Xers or Ys? So the Xers were about 12, and boomers were about 10. It was split male and female, and about 25% responded. Now, they say 25% when you have 25,000 people respond is okay. I think people would love to see a 33%. Responding, but it, you know, when you have 25,000 people, 25% response is probably pretty good. And these were the questions asked. If, if you looked at people who were very successful, was there a difference in these three things between men and women? So this is in business. This is not in medicine. This is not in law. This is in business. So who had high level responsibilities? 81% of the men and 71% of the women. Okay, it'd be great to take a look at WHO and some other things to see whether their data shows something similar. Profit and who, who got to work at profit and loss? Remember, money is important. Money and people management are the two things that promote you into leadership, right? 48% of men got experience in profit and loss and only 45% of women. Senior management jobs, 57% men, okay, and 41. Now this was done, uh, this data is from 2012 to 2013, so it's relatively recent data. Fascinating, right? So again, this is kind of like the sticky floor phenomenon that I showed you in medicine and in uh, uh, academics. Professional satisfaction. Men felt they had more meaningful work than the women. They thought their professional accomplishments were more than the women. Again, women taking that second position down. Opportunity for growth and development, the men thought they had more. And the compatibility of work and personal life. I thought that was pretty close considering who we were dealing with. Again, I'm happy to share this. We, we can send the slides up. Now, what about the expectation of a traditional partnership? So we have the Gen X people and the boomers. Okay, so everybody knows who they are, right? The Gen X and the boomers. So here's the expectations for the men and the expectations for the women. So the boomers expected to have a traditional relationship 56% of the time, in reality it was 74%. Okay, the boomer women thought only 17%. Only 17% of boomer women, women thought they have a, a traditional partnership, but in fact, 40% of the time. The expectation of a traditional female childcare setup. Expectation for boomer women, 50%, but in fact, it turned out to be 72% of women ended up that way. But look at this. The Gen X guys thought that 78%, and the, and the uh, boomer men thought 84%. And yet, the, the reality of both is similar. So it's very interesting. I find this very, very interesting. Here's a data in the Harvard Business Review in 2014. So when you go back and look at that, some things haven't changed as much as we thought. And I think that's important. This article also talks about time out, those kinds of issues, and what happens in women's leadership. 
Um, when you don't see women in leadership, you're much more likely to feel that you can't take it. Okay, so the women who have gone before and why some of these more senior women have supported um, Hillary and young women feel it doesn't matter. They see some women in leadership versus those senior women who never saw them in leadership. And it becomes important. According to the Council on Graduate Medical Education of France, gender stereotypes are considered as the single greatest deterrent to women achieving their full potential. Um, lower retention rates, lower promotion rates, and longer time for promotion for women faculty and non-white faculty indicate that there may be some non-pipeline issues, i.e. just because we see more people coming into the educational system doesn't mean that we're going to see leadership coming out in that same percentage. And I suspect that's even true here, that as we you know, educate more minorities and so forth, will we see them getting those leadership positions? Okay, and that's an important issue. So there's a growing perception that many contemporary problems have arisen because of our inability to attract and retain the most talented and most strongly motivated individuals with the highest personal integrity in positions of leadership in government, industry, and professions. So this is done by a man in 1971 who said this. He's a professor of cardiology at Harvard, still working his problem in his 90s at this point. But you know, if we don't, help women and men have equal opportunities, we're going to lose some of our great leaders. And yet we're going to look differently because men and women talk differently. And I'm not sure that's going to change. We can talk about the biology and so forth of that at another time. How many people got to read that really short article that I sent out? What did you think? Okay, I got one laugh. <laughs> Really sad but realistic. I don't think it's a lot of the information I already kind of knew about the American military. So it wasn't surprising. Okay, so so if you go back and we go all the way back, let's see if I can get all this all the way back. Uh, so were there differences in communication between her and her and the senior person? Yes. Okay, I've got some people saying yes. You want to talk about that? I think there probably were. Hard to put into words. Did you try to do her best? Did you try to talk her ways to balance the needs with those of others? Did she, um, well, she was trying to make change and uh, make opportunities equal and more fair, but it was perceived as disrespectful and out of line. And so is that a communication issue? Yes. And an expectation issue. It's so what they expect from, I guess, women in the room. Yeah. So they put chairs. Wasn't that amazing? They yeah, put chairs so that the women can sit down. I don't know if any of you have been in the military. Okay. I mean, women in this country, and then scripted into the military, but they're still not the same, right? They still don't do the same roles. And then the, you know, she's trying to make those women tougher. And what happened? Was she successful? Yeah. Yeah, she was very successful. The women, more women, were successful in it and didn't complain. Okay, they they were physically better. Um, and yet she got in trouble for making that successful, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So success doesn't lead you to being right. Oh. Do you think that there are some male uh, Marines that complain about their um, leaders? Yeah. You don't think so? Um, are they agentic? They're just following what they're supposed to be? Are they the good boys? Typically, yes. I think they are. Yeah. Especially because of how they're treated in basic training. Like, you don't speak that. That's just how it is. And do the women? Enjoy your goal. Um, they complained. They did, but I also think that's because maybe their commander was a woman, right? Right. That's why. So if their commander had been a man, maybe not. Good point. Really good point. And yet because they complained, so we're not going to see that kind of standard now for women in the Marines. Was this biased? <laughs> did they get rid of her because she was successful? <laughs> you can come to 
material conclusion. Okay? All right, but I think it's a it's a really interesting little note about women's leadership. I mean, how much more were I mean more difficult was she than most of those male commanders? She made it through to that point. She wanted the women, okay, to demonstrate that they could do this as well as men. And she got put for it. With no good reason. And yes, and in the end she was penalized. That's correct. So we can be penalized in the end for doing what we think is correct. Maybe because most of us aren't so so not so good, right? We're not good girls. Okay. I think there are a lot of men who are not good boys either. So, well, thank you for being here today and talking about a few things. What I really want you to do is as you go through the year, as you hear the women leaders and you hear the male leaders, think about some of their